Dr. Chakravarti, am I audible clearly? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Professor Nag, we're going to start it. Okay. Let me. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. So, on behalf of uh, Department of Chemistry and the SRM University AP, I welcome uh, all the participants for today's uh, uh, chemistry lecture series, Department of Chemistry, the lecture one. Uh, first of all, I hope, we hope that all of you are uh, doing good in a safe place in these uh, uh, very difficult times in this pandemic. And uh, I know all of us are going through this uh, very difficult phase of our life. But still, this gives us some opportunity that we can think about what the possible ways. And this is one of them through the virtual medium. We are connecting some of the eminent speaker. And we also got this thought uh, that how we can utilize this time to enrich ourselves and through enrich our PhD student as a whole other research scholars across India and faculty members. So with that uh, hope in mind, uh, we have organized this Department of Chemistry lecture series. And this lecture series will be uh, consist of five lectures over the next five weeks and where we have invited uh, the eminent scientists uh, across India in different versatile uh, research areas in, in the chemistry. They will give the overview and give up the what is the cutting edge research going on <coughs> in the area of uh, chemistry. So to begin with, uh, we are very uh, privileged uh, to have uh, Professor Aung Suman Nang for Indian Institute of uh, uh, Education, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISAR, uh, Pune. And uh, uh, what I can say that uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Ong Suman Nag uh, to our inaugural lecture. And uh, Professor Ong Suman Nag is uh, one of the prominent uh, uh, upcoming young material scientists in India. So you can see he has been doing very good. I, over the years, I have been following his works. Uh, our research areas overlap. So uh, to briefly introduction about Professor uh, Nag, he has completed uh, his uh, PhD from Indian Institute of Science under guidance of Professor D.D. Sarma. And then uh, he moved to University of Chicago. And there also he's worked <laughs> one of the pioneer in the field of nanocrystal, Professor Dimitri Talapin. So I still remember that we have followed his work mostly in, in, in Talapin's lab when he did uh, uh, inorganic passivation of semiconductor nanocrystals. So one of the most cited work in the area of semiconductor nanocrystals to improve the photo of the electron properties. Then once uh, he came back to India, uh, he has uh, started his career in uh, ISER Pune and he's now recently promoted as an associate professor. And he has been heavily working uh, in all areas of semiconductor nanocrystal, their synthesis, they study their optoelectronic properties and device fabrications. And uh, is uh, uh, you know in over a very short span of time, uh, Professor Nag's uh, uh, total citation is more than six thousand. So that's why I said he's one of the promising and uh, young material scientists that uh, India we are having now, uh, with the H index near to forty, near to forty. So Professor Nag. Uh, uh, got numerous uh, awards. Uh, I just I don't want to go through his CV whole. It will take quite a lot of time. Uh, he got the very uh, the uh, you know prestigious uh, Ramanujan Fellow uh, Fellowship, and then he got uh, Material uh, Research Society of India Young Scientist Award. He also got NASI Young Scientist uh, Platinum Jubilee Young Scientist Award, and he had uh, he had the recipient of various uh, department of uh, DST Department of Science and Technology Research Grants, and uh, you know. He has been uh, also serving as an editorial board member on the prestigious uh, chemistry and nanomaterial articles of the ACS, American Chemical Society, Nano Letters and Chemistry of Materials. So this is just a brief overview. And uh, we're going to definitely, I don't going to waste more time. I'm going to hear from this uh, eminent speaker, Professor Ong Shuman Nag. And today he's going to discuss uh, the optolytic properties of table sky semiconductor nanocrystals. So before I hand over to Professor Nag, again, wholeheartedly from Department of Chemistry, I welcome you and I uh, really thankful to giving his your time uh, and so we all of us are here and get us some of the motivations and idea about our research and then further I request all the participants kindly mute yourself do not unmute and at the end if you have questions please write down in the chat box myself and my colleagues will take up one by one and we'll post it to Professor Nag and Professor Nag will be happy to answer those okay with this I I, I hand to uh, hand over to uh, Professor Ong Shuman Nag okay thank you okay so first of all uh... Thanks a lot to SRM University IP and uh, particularly Dr. Nimai Mishra for uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to share some of our work. And uh, I hope I am audible to all of you and uh, 
things are fine. Okay, so uh, today I'm talking about uh, optoelectronic properties of perovskite semiconductor nanocrystals. And throughout my talk, I'll be using this uh, cursor arrow. Probably you can follow that arrow whenever I want to indicate something in the slide. There will be an arrow moving for that particular point. So have a note, please note it. And uh, uh, three weeks back, actually, I gave a very similar talk in another online platform. And uh, if some of you have already listened to it, then I'm sorry for <laughs> the repetition, but there will be some amount of repetition for uh, this talk of, uh, compared to the previous talk that I gave. Okay, so let us uh, go ahead with the uh, discussion. And uh, so optoelectronic properties, and as you know, by optoelectronic properties, we mean some properties that involves both optical and electronic properties. For example, when you talk about a solar cell, it absorbs sunlight, it's the, the light is the input and output is the electrical power. It's an optoelectronic process. Or you talk about a, uh, for example, a light emitting diodes, LEDs. Here, electrical input, electrical power is the input and output is the light. So you see a combination of both light that is optical part and the electronic part that is manifesting to a certain property, which are termed as optoelectronic properties. So uh, keeping in mind that uh, there will be, uh, I expect to be a uh, audience from a broad background, from different backgrounds. So I'll have a rather uh, uh, sort of a pretty detailed introduction part before focusing to our own work. And uh, so this is what is the plan of the talk. So I'll have a uh, detailed introduction, and then I'll go to our uh, work on a cesium lead halide perovskite nanocrystals. Then I will try to discuss some aspects of uh, lead free halide per perovskite nanocrystals, per perovskites, where it is right now, and uh, what are the uh, challenges and opportunities. And then, if time permits, then I'll talk about uh, some recent work on uh, layered perovskites. Okay, so uh, let us go to the introduction. And uh, as you know that uh, a semiconductor is the backbone of all the electronic uh, devices that we use. Right now, we are able to talk to each other through this online platform because of semiconductors. And one of the key characteristic of that semiconductor is this kind of diode behavior. And I believe uh, most of us have studied this kind of diode behaviors in our uh, college or schools that uh, so a semiconductor you see that it doesn't conduct electricity it's in the off state and uh, from 0.4 volt for example if you increase the bias a little bit a small increase in bias voltage will give a sudden jump in the current so from few microamperes you can get currents of close to 100 of milliamperes so there are four or five orders of magnitude change in current happens by small change in the applied bias or any other kind of, in terms of optoelectronics by, small, by application of light. So this modulation between on and off state by using a small external bias is the core property of a semiconductor. If you take an insulator, the insulator will remain largely in the off state. And if you take a metal, the metal will remain largely in the on state. But in semiconductors, you can easily modulate between on and off states. And that gives rise to this, your one zero digital world or digitization, et cetera. Right? So when you talk about semiconductors, the first thing that comes to our mind is the silicon. These are the mighty silicon that governs the uh, around uh, probably 90% of the semiconductor industry. These are, for example, you can see these are single crystal of silicons not prepared by us. I have taken these uh, images uh, from uh, internet. And from this uh, single crystals of silicon, you chop off thick or thin uh, sheets, which you call as a silicon wafer. Just like from potato, you get potato chips. From silicon, you get silicon chips. And these are then used to make the semiconductor chips that are there in your devices right now. Right? So, when you look at the silicon and it is such a wonderful semiconductor, it obviously gives rise a question to our mind that what else? Silicon is doing its job. Do we need any other new material? 
Can a new material compete with silicon? Now, when you to address these questions, let us uh, go to the next slide and look at it in a slightly different way. See, I'll say that uh, within my reading, the semiconductor, silicon as a semiconductor, development of silicon as a semiconductor and the industrial progress of silicon, in that case, physics, engineering has contributed a lot, but probably chemistry has not contributed a lot in developing silicon because silicon requires a very different kind of processing and uh, often chemist likes to do in the laboratory the works which are which can be made in from solutions so chemists are most fond of solution solution processability and silicon semiconductor industry doesn't rely on that kind of solution processing but something significant happened in 1980s and 90s during that period a lot of new materials that came and that's where the chemistry started to contribute heavily. So you look at organic electronics, quantum dots, disensitized solar cell, even the hybrid lead light perovskites that we are talking today, the semiconducting aspects of this lead light perovskite was uh, investigated in 1980s and 1990s in that period of time. Right? So all, in all these cases, it is the chemistry heavy and uh, chemistry came to the research of semiconductor related material during that period of time and till it's going on. Now this research, because of this, those kind of chemistry research, we see that a lot of changes that has happened in our household, in our surroundings. Say for example, in display technologies. So you can see that coming from the, this old style displays to today's flat panel display or even flexible display, or the mobile phone display, even the lighting industry, which it, during uh, 15 years back, we used to see this kind of incandescent light bulbs, which you will not see nowadays, which have become very rare. And we are looking towards the for, uh, future lighting in terms of LEDs, flexible electronics. And now I'm giving these examples because these examples you have experienced in your life, and none of this came from further development in silicon. These are coming from materials where newer semiconductors that have been prepared are being used. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is that the new material when you are trying to make, it is not to compete with silicon, it is to complement silicon. There are many applications, many properties that silicon cannot exhibit. And that in those cases, the new material is the only hope. Some of those I have listed here, but the list will keep on going. So the point I'm trying to say is that I'm trying to convince you that there are silicon is a wonderful material doing an excellent job, but at the same time, there are many other properties, many other applications that silicon cannot achieve, and you need new material to do those applications. Fine. So with this, uh, then the next question is that, what is a semiconductor? How do I know that the quality of my semiconductor is good or bad? So if I look at it, uh, you can see that uh, the primary kind of parameter that determines the quality of semiconductor is a carrier mobility or long lifetime of the carrier. By carrier, I mean the charge carriers, that is electrons or holes. So in a semiconductor, when you look at it, you know that there's a valence band, there's a conduction band, you inject an electron, and then this electron in the conduction band is supposed to conduct electricity, right? This is an energy level diagram. The same diagram, if I put in space, in space, you have this kind of two metal electrodes, two metal contacts, through which I inject an electron in the semiconductor in between the metal contact, and if the electron travels through the semiconductor, reaches to the other end of the device, that is, reaches the other end, other uh, metal contact, then only it will conduct electricity. Everything looks perfectly all right, but real life is not like this. Real life is much more complicated. In real life, you know that even your basic thermodynamics will tell that the Gibbs free energy equation that you will are familiar with, that will tell that at temperature greater than zero Kelvin, there will be always defect in a crystal. Right? You have to take care of the delta S, the entropy change, configuration entropy, entropy factor in, and then there will be always a defect in a crystal. 
So a defect in a crystal can give rise to new this kind of energy levels in the middle of the band gap, and that can trap charge carriers. In space, if you want to look at it, so you're injecting an electron here in the device, the electron is moving through the semiconductor and then it gets attracted to the defect side. So there is a defect side. Consequently, the electron doesn't reach the other side of the metal contact, other metal contact. As a result, there is no current. Or it is not only electronic, also for optoelectronics, like solar cell LED photo detectors. In those cases also you need this kind of charge transport and along with charge transport, you need optical properties, light absorption, light emission. So all these thing makes the efficiency of any device of based on semiconductor very less because of this kind of charge trapping. So one of the major problem that we have in our hand today is whenever we develop a new material, we need to take care of these defects. So just making the material will not solve our purpose. We need to make a material where these defects states can be handled in our favor. And one such material is lead halide perovskite. This is the reason why lead halide perovskite became so popular in recent time, because in lead halide perovskite, one can handle those defects easily. Now, I'll come to that point, but before that, let me just tell about what is a perovskite. And as most of you know, perovskite is a crystal structure. It is neither a material nor a solar cell. It is a structure of a crystal, and that particular crystal is calcium titanate. So the structure of a crystal, it's like here, you can see that this titanium and oxygen, it forms the octahedra. And this octahedra is extended in all three dimensions and the voids that are created are filled in by the acid cation that is calcium. Now in this kind of a calcium or titanate structure, there are many minerals that are available in earth and uh, probably you have touched those mineral and many of the oxide, metal oxide perovskite that we use in our household, like even uh, in your kitchen, most of you have used probably the gas igniter that is a piezoelectric material made of a perovskite. Uh, your capacitors that you use in various electrical circuits are perovskites. So metal oxide perovskites are enormously studied and it's a huge success. So most of us have probably used this kind of metal oxide perovskite material for different applications. But this typically these metal oxide perovskites are not good semiconductors. Instead, the new material that we are talking about is the metal or lead halide, particularly lead iodide based ones, these are a better semiconductor. And the reason also you can see by looking at your uh, undergraduate level chemistry thing that if you look at there, this so in the red, in the bracket, whatever I put, these are the electronegativity values. And you can see that lead and iodide, they have very similar electronegativity. So an electron can easily move through this kind of bond of lead iodide. On the other hand, if you look at oxides, oxygen is a very high electronegativity and the electronegativity difference between this metal and oxygen is very high. So electron will always get attracted towards oxygen and it will find difficult to move in this kind of titanium oxide bonded framework of this kind of octahedral framework of titanium oxide. So the charge carrier and also because of uh, this high electronegativity difference or high electronegativity of oxygen, the band gap will be pretty wide. So as a result, compared to metal oxide, the lead iodide based semiconductors are often a better, uh, materials are often a better semiconductor with better charge transport and lower band gap. Okay. And then, as I told earlier, that in all semiconductors, semiconductors or all crystals, there are defects, and often those defects form a deep trap states. But it has been shown in lead halide or lead iodide systems that the defects that are created are pretty close to the conduction band or valence band. That is, these are shallow defects. So defects are there, but these defects are not in the middle of band gap. So if the defects are in the middle of band gap, then those defects are called the trap states and they trap the charge carriers. But if they're very shallow defects, then still electron and hole can come back to the valence band and conduction band and they can do their job for optical and electronic properties. So in spite of having defects, this Halide, lead halide perovskites show good optoelectronic response and therefore they're called defect tolerance. Defects are 
there, but they are forgiving. The defects are not that bad. Along with this characteristic, it also has a very, this is a direct band gap material. So have a very strong absorption, light absorption and emission. So all these three properties make lead halide perovskite is a good semiconductor. And on top of that, it is very easy to make lead halide perovskites. Unlike silicon, where you need a very rigorous processing at 14, 1500 degrees Celsius for a long enough duration, a lead halide perovskite you can make even close to room temperature in a high school laboratory very easily. So it can give you some solution processability. So because of all these reasons, so this slide actually tells that why one should study lead halide perovskite and why this lead halide perovskite became so popular in last 10 years or so. It is not only showing good fundamental optical and electronic properties, it is also showing good device performance. Fine. So with this uh, rather uh, extensive introduction, if I start coming to our uh, work on the cesium lead halide nanocrystals, so these are uh, cesium lead halide nanocrystal and colloidal dispersion, which are first made by Maxim Kovalenko and workers in ETH Zurich. So during that time, we also started working, getting motivated by this report of Maxim Kovalenko, and we prepared a, a cesium lead halide nanocrystal following their methodology. So this is uh, this 2015 paper is our first paper in this direction, and uh, so this. In this paper, particularly, we discussed about how those uh, cesium lead halide nanocrystals or perovskite nanocrystals differ or advantage, disadvantage compared to the traditional nanocrystals like cadmium selenide uh, or cadmium selenide zinc sulfide, those kind of uh, um, uh, quantum dot systems. Now, you can see here that uh, one of the advantages I'd just like to point out here is that look at the narrow spectral width. Like cesium lead bromide nanocrystals, it is a pretty sharp spectral width. And this narrow spectral width means that light emitted have a very good color purity. So when you talk for uh, like high definition display, etc., HD display, HD TV, in those kind of situation, you need narrow spectral width. And as a result, uh, this with, with the help of this narrow spectral width, and uh, very bright emission. So this is just a coating, coating of a cesium lead bromide nanocrystal on a commercial UV LED, and you can see it's pretty bright. So this uh, bright emission and narrow spectral uh, would make this cesium lead uh, halide nanocrystal is a good promising material for display technologies. And many industries uh, uh, right now are trying to uh, uh, use it and check it with uh, different TV manufacturers, mobile manufacturers, about whether these nanocrystals can be used for different display technologies. Now, uh, I'll just mention one point here, which I find out very recently is that, uh, uh, you see, there's a old paper that is of 1969, 1969, before most of us are born. And that time, look at the title of the paper, and that paper is again on cesium lead chloride. It's very similar to the material that we are discussing. It's not nanocrystals, but they looked at other aspects. So I just found this paper very recently and thought to share with you. And this paper is, again, you can see that uh, from by CNR Rao and group from uh, IIT Kanpur. And this is probably the first paper from India on any halide perovskite. And in general, it's a pretty old paper and one of the early papers on lead halide perovskite in general. So I just wanted to point out uh, uh, this uh, uh, old paper and show that uh, uh, people have been working on this material for a pretty long time, though the intensity of working has increased only in recent years. OK, so when I uh, started working on um, cesium lead halide nanocrystals, so one of the major questions that uh, we were uh, trying to address is, uh, what about the defect states? Like earlier, I told that the bulk defects are not creating problem. They are uh, defect tolerant in nature. But when you make nanocrystals compared to bulk sample, there is a new kind of defects that generates, which are the surface defects. Now, is surface defects are also defect tolerant, or surface defect can kill the optical and electronic properties? 
Now, those of us who have worked on uh, colloidal quantum dot for uh, years, we know that surface defects is one of the major problem of colloidal quantum dots and for uh, reducing their electronic and optical properties, efficiencies. And uh, so that's what we wanted to look at it. And I'm not going to the details of our studies, rather I'm just giving you some parameters that came up by through our studies and details you can see in these papers, uh, which are there, these papers have all those details. So what you see is that this nanocrystal has a very high quantum efficiency, quantum yield for photoluminescence, almost 100% photoluminescence. Then our uh, collaborator in uh, uh, IIT Bombay, Dr. Arindam Choudhury, so they could show that this nanocrystal doesn't blink much. Blinking is again a technical term. If you do not know about it, do not worry, no problem. And then another of my colleague from ISER Pune, uh, that's uh, uh, Professor uh, Pankaj Mandal. So they, their group, uh, they studied our nanocrystals and they showed that uh, there's a very high carrier mobility using terahertz spectroscopy. So all this combination of results that you're seeing here, even if you are not familiar with the technicality of it, just take this point that this shows that very efficient optical and electronic processes that are happening. So in spite of having surface defects, efficient electronic and optical properties are happening. And this tells that surface defects here again do not trap the charge carriers of nanocrystals. So this is a very important point, keeping in mind that if you look at the literature, you will not find probably, and at least I could not find any other system in the literature where you made a nanocrystals and this shows this combination of properties. Right? So because this, in most of the cases, the surface defects case plays a crucial role. Now, why surface defects are uh, not that detrimental? To look at it, uh, we started to look at uh, characterizing the surface and you know when you make a nanocrystal it is very easy to characterize the crystal uh, the inorganic part but it is very difficult to characterize how the organic capping ligand on the surface is interacting with the inorganic uh, part of the nanocrystal so we took help from various uh, 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 experimental technologies uh, ex experimental techniques like uh, uh, XPS, NMR, et cetera, and our theory collaborator, uh, Prashanjit Ghosh, also studied the interaction between the organic ligands and uh, the inorganic part on the surface of nanocrystal. And all these studies give us this picture that is shown here. So what we see is that on the surface, some of the cesium plus, you see this is at the lattice and cesium plus are sitting in the corners, what you see is that some of the cesium plus are getting replaced by olyl ammonium plus. Olyl ammonium, you know, it's ammonium and you replace one of the hydrogen with a long carbon chain, olyl chain, so it's olyl ammonium plus. So the capping ligand that we are talking about here is sort of a substitution reaction. Some part of cesium plus is getting replaced by olyl ammonium plus. It is pretty different than the regular scenario where you have an inorganic moiety, and in that inorganic moiety, the organic ligand is coming as an addition. So instead of this kind of addition, we find that it's mostly the substitution. And how does this relevant for uh, defect, uh, for uh, neutralizing the surface defects? It has been shown by all the uh, theoretical works or DFT calculation that the cesium plus, it doesn't contribute near the valence bend or conduction bend. So if you disturb cesium plus, you do not disturb much of the valence bend con conduction bend, so it doesn't give deep defects. And there's a theoretical study from another group, it's not our study. You can see that what they have done is they've made theoretically different uh, uh, sizes of cesium lead halide nanocrystals. And in those nanocrystals, they have replaced exactly the same model that I've been showing up. They've replaced some of the cesium ion with a Methyl ammonium, instead of long oil, oil chain, they only had a methyl chain. And when they replace some of the cesium plus with methyl ammonium, you can see that this is the conduction band and valence band. You do not see any deep trap that has been created on the mid gap region. Right? So that's the reason why the surface defects also are 
forgiving in nature and surf surface defects also do not uh, trap the charged carriers and therefore the cesium lead halide nanocrystals without making any core shell or anything it shows a very intense light emission and good optoelectronic properties in terms of uh, solar cell efficiencies or even light emitting diodes people are making some progress in those directions okay maybe i'll just skip this slide so you can play with the composition get different color etc so uh, what i'll go is the next point the next point is so first i give an introduction then i talked about uh, how good is the lead halide perovskite nanocrystals and then the point i'm taking talking about this i'm sure uh, uh, more than 70 80% of the audience have a question ready in mind that what about the lead toxicity so lead toxicity and instability is a question different people interpret in different ways but uh, let me just tell that you know if you look at the regulatory bodies the uh, european regulatory bodies which essentially governs or not i'll not say govern which essentially give the road map for the international all countries regulatory bodies it tells that you can use this kind of solar cell and other optoelectronic devices with the uh, lead content about 0.1 weight percent of the entire device so this is a permissible 0.1 weight percent and this permissible limit within this permissible limit people are making solar cell people and when i say uh, different uh, groups are making i am not talking about only the research groups i am talking the industries who are looking for commercializing those so it is not that because of lead toxicity and it cannot be commercialized at all but there is definitely restrictions there are definitely restrictions and uh, we, though there are progress are being made so in general obviously one would like to have a system that is so widely used device if a widely used device are made up out of some material then one would like to have them non toxic as possible as uh, environmental benign and more stable so there is a big challenges are there in terms of toxicity and stability and lot of work is going on across the globe now in this direction we also worked on making some of the nanocrystal materials of lead free perovskites and uh, for example we made uh, this kind of uh, uh, cesium antimony halide nanocrystals thallium halide nanocrystals so these are the nanocrystal that we made for the first time and these nano, nano nanocrystalline forms were not uh, uh, available earlier so we made them studied their optical electronic properties but uh, it, the truth is that none of this material are as good as lead halide perovskites so their optical and electronic properties are significantly inferior compared to the lead halide perovskite at least today it may change scenario may change somebody will come up with a better synthesis better uh, uh, parameters and it will it may improve but at least today lead halide per there is uh, the alternative of lead halide perovskites are not that successful and one of the reason is that whenever you go for different kind of systems lead free system you end up with uh, some structures that are uh, not really three dimensional perovskite structure you get perovskite derivatives you get 2d perovskite 0d 1d and that has some consequences in their electronic transport properties so uh, in general within my reading if you are looking for a solar cell then you must need to be careful in spite of lot of effort with different kind of lead free solar cell the success is not great however one can think of something different now the success of lead halide perovskite has taught us many thing and one can use those uh, information those knowledge and try to look for many other properties and application much different than solar cell for example solar cell is not the end of the world right there are many other applications one can do and uh, i'll just uh, give you an example on that direction and so what we started to work on is a double perovskite now double perovskite is so this is your regular perovskite cesium lead chloride for example just writing it 
cesium 2 led to cl6 it's exactly same as cesium led cesium pbcl3 now in this perovskite you can replace two lead 2 plus ions with one metal ions with positive one plus charge like silver plus and another trivalent metal ion that is indium 3 plus so you maintain the charge neutrality two lead 2 plus is replaced by one silver plus and one indium 3 plus so you maintain the charge neutrality so therefore you get the you retain the 3d perovskite structures so these are silver chloride and indium chloride octahedra that are arranged alternatively in these structures so this is the double perovskite structure now the problem with this kind of uh, double perovskites is that um, for the majority of the double perovskite that are um, metal halide double perovskite that are known today you'll see that the transitions the optical transitions are forbidden from the valence band to the conduction band and the reverse so light absorption and emission at the band edges are remained still uh, a question so what we try to do is that instead of uh, uh, so uh, we wanted to have some optical functionality and for doing that what we plan to do is we want to add some kind of dopant state and that will allow both the absorption and emission so that's the overall strategy and when you go for it one thing that comes to our mind is the lanthanides so uh, even today the room lights that you are seeing are coming from most likely it is uh, it is using the lanthanide based phosphor so lanthanides are a well known material for light emission well known uh, lanthanide complexes etc but in inorganic chemistry classes we know that lanthanides is a pretty big uh, are big ions and they require coordination number six or more that is lanthanide require octahedral coordination or a higher coordination lanthanide cannot have a tetrahedral coordination and on the other end if you look at semiconductors like silicon cadmium selenide gallium arsenide name any other semiconductor apart from perovskite most likely that the structure will have a tetrahedral coordination so that means the lanthanide doping in semiconductor remain a difficult task and it is true till today uh, lanthanide doping in semiconductors are difficult so often lanthanides are doped in wide band gap insulators or molecular complexes are made but lanthanide doping in semiconductors are problem so when you have this kind of octahedral uh, semiconductor in terms of in the case of perovskites it gives an opportunity to dope lanthanides in a semiconductor it's a long way to go we have not gone that that far but i'll just share you one of our work in that direction so here you can see that i've written both bismuth and rbm doping rbm is a lanthanide and bismuth is not lanthanide so i've just written this is a co-doping the reason i'll be explaining here so you can see that this is an absorption data of undoped that is cesium uh, silver indium chloride the black line and you can see that it doesn't absorb at wavelengths more than 350 nanometer now if you want to use any uh, commercial uv leds etc that emits those commercial UV LEDs emit at 370 nanometer, 400 nanometer or above, but less than 350, the LED, UV lights LED efficiency goes down very much. So you need, so even if you dope lanthanide in this cesium silver indium chloride, a commercial UV LED will not be sufficient to excite. So you need to tailor the absorption also. So it is not only emission here with bismuth we are tailoring the absorption also and you can see that if you put some bismuth you get a new absorption and this absorption tailoring uh, is often not uh, seen in other kind of dopants like lanthanides manganese etc but with the bismuth you can tailor the absorption and when you have it so you can have uh, for example you can look at the emission profiles and you can see that uh, this is uh, uh, broad emission that is again coming from bismuth and uh, so with this broad emission here you can just coat this material on a commercial uv led and you can see that uh, uh, the white light coming because of broad emission and along with this broad emission you can have uh, uh, emission coming from rbm which is at around 1540 nanometer it's in the infrared region right near infrared region and uh, those who are uh, 
familiar with optical fiber or telecommunication, you will immediately figure out that this wavelength range is perfectly suitable for those kind of optical fiber communication because in optical fibers, uh, this is the wavelength that is the low loss. Uh, so if, if you try, if in optical fiber communication, this wavelength doesn't suffer from loss, optical loss, and that's why this is a desired uh, wavelength. So you can see that uh, from very far from solar cell, you can look at these other aspects uh, and uh, you can look for new properties. Now, another direction, maybe I'll stop after this slide because I'm uh, coming to closer of my time uh, or... Uh, okay, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then you can see that uh, this is uh, uh, another example that I'm trying to highlight is something called chalcogenite perovskite. It's different than the halite perovskite that we've been discussing so far. Right? Now, I'm, I'm just highlighting this to uh, get your attention here is that you look, uh, oxide perovskite, as I told earlier, is a enormously studied and hugely successful adelite perovskite. Unfortunately, many times the uh, uh, young students who are starting the research, they think that uh, the halide perovskite is the only perovskite, but more, before halide perovskite is a huge and much more successful story is there with oxide perovskite. Please look at uh, those aspects. And those uh, oxide perovskites doesn't have a problem of stability. They're very stable, but they have a problem. They, they, as I told earlier, they're not good semiconductor. On the other hand, we talk about halide perovskites, they are good semiconductors, but they are not stable. So in between halides and oxides, there are chalcogenides like sulfide, selenide, telluride, those kind of system. So can I make some chalcogenide perovskites that combines the stability of oxi oxide ones and uh, um, good semiconducting properties of halide ones? Is it possible? To answer this question, there are many theoretical studies that has been done in uh, recent time, DFT-based calculations, and they show that, uh, yes, it is possible to have a barium zirconium sulfide or other kind of chalcogenide perovskite with good optoelectronic properties. But then experimentally, what has been done is uh, synthesis of this material. So you can have this kind of solid state uh, synthesis. You note the re reaction temperatures. So you put it in a cell tube, do a solid state reaction, 600 degrees Celsius for 60 hours for five days or so. Now, now when you do this, the entire process, you get the powders of barium zirconium sulfide. Now, what do you do with these powders? To look at optoelectronic properties, you need to make a thin film. Now, how do you make a thin film out of these powders? So in this regard, uh, one of my uh, student, uh, so because he has uh, did surface modification, so he took these powders obtained from this solid state reaction and he did surface modification and they can make this dispersion of barium zirconium sulfide. And this became possible because in spite of this solid state reaction at high temperature, TM shows that there are, these are some nanocrystals of 60, 70 nanometer size random size, size distribution is bad, which is expected because you are using a solid state reaction, not the usual colloidal synthesis. But nevertheless, by seeing this nanocrystals, it uh, gave us hope and allowed us to do the surface modification to get a colloidal system. And from there, you can make a thin film. And from thin film, you can have absorption, emission. And uh, my collaborator, uh, Dae Sang Chang from Postec uh, Korea, he measured the carrier mobilities and they show reasonable carrier mobilities to start with. So what I'm trying to show you here is that here I'm trying to show you a brand possibility of a brand new direction of perovskite materials, which are chalcogenide perovskite. These are very early studies, not yet optimized. You cannot compare the performance right now with lead halide because it's a very premature, but this, that, that it looks like there is some promise and uh, to move forward in this direction. And if it becomes successful, then you will have a semiconductor with the chalcogenide perovskite, which will be even stable and will not have a problem of lead toxicity. So it's much of future work that needs to be done in this direction, right? So after that, I thought to talk about um, uh, layered perovskite, and uh, but this story, if I start, it will take another 15 minutes. So I'll not go into the details. I'll just uh, 
give you a, here again a highlight of it in a couple of minutes and I'll go to the conclusions. So you can see that uh, this is a, the 3D perovskite that I've been discussing. Now in 3D perovskite, if you replace the acid cation with long organic ligands, that time you get a 2D layers, right? These are 2D layers of lead halide and they are separated by organic molecules. These are insulating. So you have a semiconductor layer, insulator layer, semiconductor, insulator. And this semiconductor insulator is getting stacked up over a large range, making a millimeter thick crystal. So one can get this kind of single crystals, which are millimeter thick and uh, uh, lateral dimension approaching a centimeter. But in this big single crystal, you see nanoscale phenomena. The nanoscale phenomena is coming from the structure. You see a quantum oil structure that you are generating, and that gives rise to many interesting optical properties, and uh, which we worked on. And uh, uh, there are some interesting aspect of it, but I'm not going to the details. If you're interested, please uh, read our recent paper. Yeah. So, so with this I come to the conclusion and outlook slide. So here uh, I'll put it in two different categories. One is lead halide perovskites. So what is the status of lead halide perovskite? It's an excellent material. Inside the lab, it has good solar cell efficiency, display. Uh, this, there is opportunity for building integrated photovoltaics, LEDs, all those things are ex absolutely fine. But at the same time, there are challenges which still we need to sort out is the stability and uh, one way I think the chemistry community can uh, contribute more is understanding the mechanistic pathways of the degradation of those devices, how those devices degrade, essentially how those parts get degrade. And based on those uh, de degradation methodology, one can find out the device stability test. For example, you make a device now, whether this device will remain stable after, if you commercialize, you have to see that whether this device will be stable after 10 years or no, or not. So after 15 years, 20 years, whether the device will be stable or not, to evaluate that, you need to come up with new testing uh, 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 testing protocols. And uh, in this regard, again, chemistry can contribute a lot. One can look for uh, industrially accessible processability. I've been telling that solution processed perovskites are the uh, solution processability is an advantage of perovskite, but then you'll see more than probably 95% of the papers, they use DMF, dimethylformamide, uh, for uh, solution processability, which is at present not uh, acceptable by industries. So there are lots of scope of that kind is there. And the other side, so first part of lead halide perovskite is more towards application right now. And the other side is the lead free perovskite is more towards the new exploration. So if you want to explore new materials, utilizing the knowledge that is gained in lead halide perovskite, then you can make novel uh, compositions of uh, metal halide perovskite, chalcogenide perovskite, look at new structures. And then you can look for new properties like infrared optoelectronics, optical communication, remote thermometry, anti counterfeiting, many new R applications which are far from solar cells. And that is another uh, playground for chemistry right now. So, with this, I acknowledge the people who did the work. So, these are uh, photographs of uh, my group members uh, taken at two different times. So uh, this, I'm, it's, I'm not going in, in reading the name of all of them, but they are the wonderful group of bunch of uh, people who does all the work. And my job here is only to present their work. So everything that I'm presenting is because of them. And they are the ones who did the, the work. I'm just presenting their work. And then there are some aspects which they cannot do. Then we go to collaborators. So we have uh, lots of uh, collaboration across the globe. So we have uh, spectroscopy partners, uh, like uh, others from ISER, uh, Bhopal, Arindam Choudhury, IIT Bombay, Pankaj Mandal, ISER Pune, Shelja Mohamani, Pune University, Pralai Santra, Sense Bangalore. Then uh, uh, the device guys like Desang Chang uh, from Postec, Emmanuel uh, from France, uh, Dinesh Kabra from IIT Bombay. And then there are theory collaborator who does DFT calculations. Sudeep uh, from uh, uh, IIT Indore, uh, Priya from uh, Senbos, Kolkata, and Prashanjit from ISAR Pune. And the funding comes from ISAR Pune, DST Nanomission, and STRB 
without their funding support, we cannot do anything. So with this, I thank you all for your patience. And if you are interested, if you're a beginner in this field and want to know about this, you can uh, refer to these review articles that are there. Of course, there are many more review articles. You can study those also, but this is just for your uh, beginning. So with this, I thank and I uh, get it. Uh, it's over to now my Mr. And, uh, sure, sure. Okay. Professor Nag, uh, it is a very wonderful and very informative lecture. I really enjoy it. I just uh, not able to uh, put my attention anywhere else. I just listening to you. Very, thank you so much for su such an informative lecture. I hope uh, it is same thing. I can see in chat box, uh, very well received. People are commenting, very informative. And there are a few questions. So I like to go by one by one. So Mr. Shyan Mondal, he has asked, sir, can cesium plus be replaced by another organic ligands like OLL ammonium? You explained the same thing, I think, but yeah. Can you take this question? So now when I say replaced, it is, you have to look at two aspects. Are you talking about replacing inside the lattice? If it is inside the crystal lattice, then OLL ammonium plus is a too big and it will not accommodate in the crystal lattice. Right. So one can replace cesium plus with other metal ions as, or uh, like rubidium plus or even uh, uh, organic ions like methyl ammonium plus, formadinium plus. People have done those things already. And the other aspect that I was discussing is on the surface. So in the surface, if I replace a cesium, there's a long olein ammonium chain, but that change is, chain is outside the crystal. So it is just dangling around on the surface and it's not a problem. So yes, cesium plus can be replaced by various cations based on the size of cations, organic or inorganic. It will decide whether you want to replace it in the crystal or on the surface. Thank you so much. In this connection, I do have also a question. So uh, does, uh, if the oleal ammonium take away the cesium plus, it does not affect anything on the band gaps, right? Because cesium do not have any contribution on the bands. So it does not change any of the optical property. Am I right? Yeah, it is not influencing much. much. So you do not see any uh, significant uh, change. Uh, so apart from it take away the cesium plus, is this possibility oleal ammonium can take the bromine minus out of the surface? Yeah, so what I will, I will look at it as a hmm. two way. Uh, one way is, so it is uh, not taking away the cesium plus, one way of interaction is the oleal ammonium plus is uh -huh. coming and sitting, replacing cesium plus. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So one is this aspect. The other way of looking at it is that you have a oleal ammonium bromide, bromine ion pair, and that mm -hmm. ion pair is coming and uh, sitting there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. The next questions, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Tufan goes, uh, dear Professor Nag, thank you for very much for your informative talk. My question is, why you got a narrow band uh, emissions for pebosite compared to conventional semiconductor nanocrystal? Is this emission bandwidth tunable for pebosite nanocrystals? Yeah, so uh, emission, you see, uh, th this is an interesting aspect and uh, th this aspect uh, we discussed very uh, rigorously in our first paper of 2015 is that, mm -hmm. so when you get uh, cadmium selenide, for example, or other semiconductor, we mm -hmm. take the size very much in the so-called quantum confinement region to get strong emission. Now, when you get the size in a good quantum confinement region, to get a better emission intensity, that time the emission wavelength is very sensitive to size. So the size distribution will broaden the emission line width. In the case of the cesium lead halide perovskite, you don't need to go to the strong confinement region. You are just in the, in the very weak confinement and even some cases there is not significant quantum confinement. So the size distribution related broadening is absent or very minimal in this kind of uh, uh, cesium lead halide nanocrystal. And that helps you to retain a narrow spectral shape. And of course, one can tune the wavelength of the emission by tuning composition and uh, even uh, shape and morphology. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question from uh, Ashita Dube. And uh, it is uh, asking, Inside number uh, 13, I mean slide number 13, is bismuth can be, uh, bismuth and iridium replaces which atoms? So uh, we have not, uh, it's a, a good question and uh, one need to do exact studies and to understand, uh, get a very clear answer to this question. But within our wisdom and within our understanding, 
what we see is that see bismuth is in 3 plus rbm is in 3 plus and indium is in 3 plus silver is in single plus monocation right? mm -hmm. so i would expect that it is most likely that bismuth 3 plus and rbm 3 plus are replacing indium 3 plus sites but we do not have evidence to tell you that yes it is happening okay thank you and the next questions uh, from ajay padimol uh, if I'm not wrong, I think it's Dr. Ajay Podimal from ISAR uh, Bahrampur. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. So he's asking, uh, how can we confirm formation of double preboscites if they are not direct band gap material, including X-ray based techniques? Is there a simple way to confirm formation of double preboscites? So I will uh, look at the formation of double preboscite by XRD. So uh, yeah. X-ray crystal structure will, without looking at the optical property, I'll confirm it by looking at the X-ray diffraction pattern and uh, how it is coming. So uh -huh. uh, in fact, there are many theoretical studies have been done uh, on different phases, say instead of uh, uh, making uh, alternative arrangement of uh, say silver chloride, indium chloride, what happens if the silver chloride's are arranged together, or indium chloride's are arranged together. So there are lots of uh, theoretical studies have been also done on this and uh, finding that the alternative arrangement gives the thermodynamically stable state. And by with X-ray exerted diffraction, even with the powder X-ray diffraction, we can get pretty conclusive evidence that double perovskite has been mm -hmm. formed. So, Professor Nak, there are many more questions. We'd like to take another three, four. It is okay for you? I'm fine. Okay, okay. So, go ahead. So, next question from Tamal Pal. He's asking, sir, according to you, which process is make proboscite nanocrystal is better? Hot injection or LAR? PLR means ligand assistance. So, yeah, please go ahead. It depends on who is making it also. <laughs> True, I agree. <laughs> uh, so, there is no uh, uh, clear answer that this is good or that is bad. Uh, it depends upon how those are, systems are made. And uh, these perovskite systems are, in terms of formation, it's pretty easy and uh, it can give you very good uh, properties by different methods. So mm -hmm. one need to take care of uh, certain aspects when you are washing those perovskites. In fact, washing those perovskite nanocrystals are probably more challenging than making them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, one to, so, so I'll not say this or that, both are good. Uh -huh. Make it with attention, prepare it with the careful. Uh, Right, and, right, right, right. That, that is true. We can say that, you know, in the Talapins, that uh, tetapods paper, when we tried to reproduce, it took me six months, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. So one more question from Asita Dube, what she's asking, what surface modification you have done to make thin flints out of uh, barium zirconium sulfide preboscites? Since it's really quite difficult task to make nice dispersion solvent and further thin flints when we synthesize uh, by solid state. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she is, looks like she has already made uh, this kind of systems. And uh, uh -huh. so the surface modification, I, I'm not, I have not given much details of it because it's also the paper under consideration and it will come. But I can tell you that uh, you can uh, make surface modification in a way that you can get uh, uh, the nanocrystal dispersible in some of the polar solvents. Also, you can make surface polar like NMP. You can make it surface modification with system like oil ammonium, and you can make it uh, soluble in a, a chloroform-based system, which rather we used for making, a, because chloroform can evaporate easily, so used it for spin coating and developing uh, uh, the FET and other devices. So you can have a couple of options to make it polar and non-polar, but more details will come uh, when the paper get accepted. Yeah. I understand. So last couple of questions uh, from Gopal Krishna Gandhi. Uh, informatic talk, Professor Nag, as always. Uh, can you elaborate on the optical properties of this barium, barium, zirconium sulfide? Is it a defect uh, emissions or do they have a direct band gap? So barium, zirconium sulfide has a direct band gap. Okay. And the, it, the emission also that we see, it uh, comes closer to the direct band gap. It looks like it is a direct band gap or excitonic emission or bandage emission, whatever you say. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I'd say that uh, right now, most cases, the emission is very weak, very mm -hmm. poor emission intensity. And it will require a kind of a better synthesis, I believe. At present, we do not have a better control of the synthesis conditions. So I feel that if we can control the synthesis condition better, 
uh, then uh, it will improve this image. So intrinsically, it is a direct band gap system and it is showing very strong absorption, but it is showing weak emission. And problem with the at present is that, you know, the sulfur is a volatile at high temperature, like 600 degrees Celsius. And we do not know how to synthesize at lower temperature. So at 600 degrees Celsius, oh, sulfur can oh, become, uh, uh, it can make many defect states. It, it can diffuse through it. There can be sulfur deficiencies, which creates a problem here. Okay. So if we can figure out a lower temperature synthesis, maybe with more active precursor, which is required right now, then I believe it will improve much more. Yeah, thank you so much. I think this is the last question I'll take because there are uh, 20 more questions they posted. That, that shows uh, how interested and how uh, interested your work everybody is. So <laughs> that is very good. Uh, and the next question, I think Somnath Das, uh, I think Somnath Das is from HCU. Mm, uh, uh, does the surface of PV nanocrystals contain only oleal ammonium cation or it's an, an encapsulation of oleal ammonium olet both? Yeah, so there, there is a lot of study in those. You, you'll see that uh, literature is there. So in the synthesis of nanocrystal, we need both there is a paper I have given our reference also is a Jeffy scam letter uh, paper you can go to that so this issue has been discussed in more detail there so for the synthesis you need both oil ammonium and oleic acid so it brings an equilibrium between oil ammonium plus and oleate minus so there is an equilibrium state that is required but what I see is that by using uh, XPS, NMR, etc. the binding site that is coming to the surface of nanocrystal is oleal ammonium plus. But if I do not add oleic acid, things doesn't work. Yeah. We need a particular proportion of oleic acid and oleal amine. So both are there, both are present, but our experimental study shows that the binding site is the oleal ammonium plus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is the, maybe the last one. Maybe one uh, student, BSc or master student, maybe he has uh, he or she has asked, uh, sir, how electronegativity matter charge transfer between lead and iodide ion? Yeah. So but, you know, but I have tried to tell it in terms of uh, undergraduate chemistry language. That's why I invoke the electronegativity. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll tell that one. Say so you, you have a chemical bond, just a molecular orbital theory. You have a chemical bond with uh, one highly electronegative, say oxygen and uh, uh, titanium in that case that you, you had. So in that bond, the electron is more, the, the bond is ionized, the electron is more towards oxygen. It will not like to go towards titanium. Now for a charge transport, you need the electron that should travel through all the atoms there. Like if you have a silicon, for example, gallium arsenide, lead iodide, where there's a covalent bond. So you need a more covalent nature of the bond to have a better charge transport so that the electron can move across all the atoms. That's what is required. Now in a more accurate and a better language to explain the same thing is the effective mass of electron. When somebody does a DFT calculation, they will see the overlap between orbital, how they're overlapping. And from there, they'll find the effective mass of electron. So if the electronic, if the bond is more covalent, you'll see that in most cases, the effective mass of electron is less. That means carrier mobility is more. So the electronic activity aspect that I told is a rather crude way to explain to an undergraduate student about this. So thank you so much, Professor Nag. There are many more questions, so, but time has its essence. Let us stop here. Uh, really, we are thankful on behalf of Department of Chemistry. So you, uh, give your time and share some of very interesting results uh, that uh, we can see from the enthusiasm from the participant, uh, their questions. Uh, they All of us are like it. We learned a lot. So thank you again. Hope uh, in near future things got uh, better and everything. Then we can meet physically. We can invite you here in SRMFE physically. You can visit our campus and we also look forward to maybe in some conference so we can go to ISAT Pune in near future. Okay. So that's all depends on this, how this COVID-19 scenario so again, on behalf of our four, five faculty members, I'm really thankful for your informative talk. And uh, we, uh, we should continue this fascinating work and we need to we'd like to hear you again and again, maybe next year with all much more fascinating work. So with this, uh, uh, we'd like to end today's uh, session. Okay, and yeah. uh, you, can, you can leave the meeting. And uh, 
some other question maybe i can uh, share with you uh, what are the people yeah. are thinking yeah. i can e email you and for the other participant uh, just for a small announcement uh, we'll share the feedback link uh, from our office uh, they will share it also the e certificate also will be given all the participant but you bear with us some time and one more important announcement this is a part of a lecture series there are four more lectures and next week uh, professor yu bharadaraju from iit madras is going to give a talk on research advancement of lithium ion batteries so do register uh, means if you already registered the no worries uh, will remind you do register and come back uh, if you interested to uh, regarding lithium hopefully uh, yeah, all of us are interested so it will be again a good talk so with that we are going to end here again uh, from all of us thank you so much omshumanda thank you so much we thank wish you, to sir. see you much more uh, this kind of fascinating work and uh, you know personally we feel uh, we want to see you to get a bhadnagar awardi and uh, that, uh, that is oh, our this best, is not uh, the platform uh, uh, that's okay that is our our best wishes from our side okay so thanks a lot thanks a lot for uh, hosting me and giving me this opportunity to, to present our work and uh, yes uh, yeah. as you mentioned hopefully we will interact physically more and uh, if situation permits you are most welcome to visit us in uh, iser pune thank you yeah, yeah thank thank you okay, okay. Yeah. you can leave the you can leave the meeting okay yeah. oh, oh, thank you Yeah, uh, Mr. Ganesh. Mr. Yes, Ganesh. Uh, so I'm making you yeah, host yes. as you as you yeah. So Yo, yeah. Okay. So you are the host now, and uh, and so I am leaving the okay, meeting. Then. It's okay, Dr. Chakravarti. Have we oh, all done? Good. Yeah, we can. Okay. Move. Okay. 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 Then. And thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. We like to thank again all the participants for your time. Okay, thank you so much. Hope to see you again next week. Sure. Okay, bye. Sure. 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 Sure.